I'm Keith Morris, and I'm one of the founding members of the Circle Jerks. Our guitarist, Greg Hudson, was a member of Red Cross with the McDonald Brothers, and I was the lead vocalist in a band called Black Flag. We all hung out at the same place, a Baptist church down in Hermosa Beach. We all rehearsed in the Baptist church. Red Cross needed a new drummer. Ron had quit, and I had found Lucky. My brother, Chet, from LA's Wasted Youth, hooked me up with Greg and did a, uh, a practice with Red Cross. The McDonald brothers didn't want Lucky in the band. So it didn't work out that well. Um, but a week later, Greg quit. Greg had become frustrated with Red Cross and their lack of rehearsal. Two days later, Keith Morris got either thrown out of or quit Black Flag. Right around the time Keith quits Black Flag, Ron becomes a singer of Black Flag, also known as Chavo. The situation with Black Flag was we had been banned from all of the clubs because the LAPD and the Hermosa Beach Police you know, had us on their most wanted list. We were rehearsing, but not going out and playing. Sometimes you just didn't want to practice. It was like, I want to go into Hollywood. Can you guys give me a ride into Hollywood? I want to go see this gig. That's how I kind of became friends with Keith, by him hopping in my truck and uh, getting him to ditch Black Flag practice. So I'm standing in this hallway in the basement of the church with Greg and Lucky, thinking to myself, well, I'm a vocalist. Lucky's a drummer, Greg's a guitar player. All we need is a bass player and we could be a band. By that point, um, L.A. punk was sort of taking on its own identity, distinct from uh, the way music uh, that I was originally used to in Northern California. The, the pogoing was out uh, into uh, more slam. Things started changing. More kids from the suburbs were coming out. A bunch of kids from Huntington Beach area, Orange County. It started to get a little bit more hectic. They were crazy. They'd be like doing the worm and doing stage dives and like, starting this pit thing that we've never seen before. Things were getting faster, things were getting shorter, but you also have to throw into the mix. Things were getting crazier. Gigs went from like being a hall gig, a successful hall gig of two or three hundred people, you know, to five and then a thousand people, and the shows got bigger and bigger. A lot of skate kids, a lot of surf kids. Reaction to the music was more aggressive. <laughs> In the beginning, there was Black Flag, and there was the tourists, who would have been Stephen McDonald, Jeffrey McDonald, Ron Reyes, Greg Hudson. Steve was 11 when we first started. He ended up turning 12 early on into the formation of the band, but there really weren't a lot of young kids playing punk rock. Our peers was a band called The Last, the Nolte Brothers, even though they weren't a punk rock band. They had that energy. Polly Walk Park, okay, that was our first show. 
the descendants would eventually come out of the church, but they were kind of a little organism of their own. July 26, 1979, I have uh, here framed the, uh, this is the uh, little blurb in the, the local rag, the easy reader. Eddie and the subtitles did not get to play. They were gonna headline, and we played, and they're like, oh, a bunch of cute kids playing kind of like fast music. But when Black Flag came on, all hell broke loose, and uh, people started throwing watermelons and pieces of chicken and beer cans, and it kind of turned into a little riot. We played, everybody hated us. Nobody understood what we were doing, because everybody was used to hearing the top 40 bands. They didn't get that style yet. It was too aggressive, too weird. Well, we didn't want to play Led Zeppelin. We didn't want to play Fleetwood Mac. We didn't want to play the Doobie Brothers. January 1980, we started practicing, me, Lucky, Roger, and Keith. I was living in Inglewood, and I had a garage in Inglewood, and that's where we started playing. I thought that Keith was the best front man in, in L.A., and I was like, I can't believe he wants to be in a band with me because I can barely play guitar. We were uh, putting together songs, and um, it happened pretty quickly. You know, we got popular pretty quickly, probably because you know Keith coming from Black Flag, me coming from Red Cross, probably more because of Keith. We had no management. We had no plan as to what we wanted to do. We started off just doing, you know, the normal things that people probably do when they are, you know, haven't played or, you know, meeting each other for the first time, like, uh, you know, a Ramon song or let's jam on some Sex Pistols tune to just loosen up. So I go, I got this riff, dee -dee -dee -dee. and then uh, Roger goes, well, I got this part, and Lucky's like, I'm gonna play this beat over it. I started off with this sort of staccato or syncopated mambo thing and uh, then Greg filled it in and we basically uh, that's how Back Against the Wall was born and I mean we just looked at each other and it's like whoa you know this is like this is kicks ass <laughs>
also a time where there's a lot of fear of anything new and a reactionary police chief, Daryl Gates, they didn't take too kindly to this punk rock thing and occasionally they would come in and break up shows violently without provocation. If the cops didn't come, they would send the fire marshal to do the cops' dirty work. So the fire marshal would close it down, then the kids would get pissed, and maybe someone would break something, and then it was an excuse for the cops to come in and blame the kids and beat them up and try to crush this, this movement because they, you know, they wiped the, the hippies off the face of the planet in the 60s and these people weren't singing about peace and love, they were thinking about, you know, fuck authority, fuck the police, fuck your parents, fuck the schools. The suburban life is, a, you know, fallacy. People would slam into the drum set, you know, at least a few times a show. And all of a sudden I'm playing and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, that symbol's really close. And whoa, there's the crash symbol coming down. And I just figured the whole idea was to just keep it going. And it was just wild, crazy, but very exciting times. Everybody had to stay on their toes. Even while they were fucked up out of their minds. We were at Ray Pettibone, the artist house, one day, which is Greg Ginn's brother, and we were looking through this American slang dictionary from the late 60s. We saw Circle Jerk. Roger wouldn't tell his parents for a long time what the name of the band was. He was embarrassed. So I can't tell my dad that name. <laughs> I grew up in a very laid-back, surfer-friendly, tourist-friendly, beachfront community, Hermosa Beach. As open-minded as it was, it was also very conservative. Uh, my dad was a member of the city council. He told them to go fuck themselves, and maybe that's where I get some of my anger and crazy energy. Spontaneity, key part of it. A lot of spontaneous combustion and energy. Just go for it kind of attitude. Like, don't just look at it and try to figure it out and try to assess it. Just jump into it, go for it. People want to live on the edge. People want to like be dancing at, on, the, on the razor's edge and not know uh, what's going to happen. And that's what it was like at the shows and that's what the music uh, embodied. <laughs> That's the whole thing about punk rock. Oh, it was the blind leading the blind. There's no division between crowd and, and artists, and that's what the whole punk rock thing was to me, what attracted me to it. I'd already established myself with Black Flag, and people knew who I was. The thing with the Circle Jerks was that we had more of a pop sensibility. We had more of a rock and roll sensibility. We had a drummer that could play jazz. 
songs like Red Tape and the whole idea uh, that you see in so many jazz pieces of trading fours. We were very sarcastic and very loose compared to Black Flag. Room 13, which is basically just a bunch of paradiddles. The Black Flag vibe was, we're, we're gonna blow things up, whereas the Circle Jerks were, were the guys that wanted a party and like, let's have a good time, you know, our day jobs suck and life blows and let's just, you know, get together at night and orgy and just like make a bunch of noise and have fun. <laughs> So it was real easy for the Circle Jerks to open for the Alley Cats at the Starwood and then two months later headline the Starwood. It wasn't real rock star, quote unquote. I, I never thought that that was the, um, the ambition of it. You know, now we can play with the adolescents over at the Polish Auditorium on Crenshaw Boulevard and have a thousand people. This was our first Starwood gig. Opened up for, oh, middle class and alley cast. I'm sorry, I thought it was fear. We are playing a 45 minute set and we literally had 14 songs. We just wanted to get in, make our point, get out, and get on to the next song. The punk bands were using more of the pop formula. You know, two and a half minutes, which is great, you know. But we wanted to take it to the next level and play twice as fast, or four times as fast, and, and shorter. <laughs> sex album which is a masterpiece all of a sudden you're hearing a punk rock album well something that's being followed under punk rock or hardcore whatever you want to call it where the rhythm section is not only tight but they've got chops there's articulation there's swinging it's like syncopated we were used to bands that could kind of thrash and smash along and even the bad brains who were so tight and so great were not clear and the circle jerks, you could hear every note. You know, I was a hardcore drummer, and that was a big uh, album to, you know, try to play to, and then, you know, play it on 45 and try to play along to it then, and it's like, try to get super fast. It was pretty fast already, you know, that's, that was one of the faster records I heard at the time when it came out. That record, no doubt, had a big influence on rhythm sections, I know that Ian Mackay was fascinated by how the Circle Jerks locked up because of that, that real, because there's so much power in that almost metric building of a riff. Beverly Hills, Century City, everything's so nice and pretty, all the people the same don't they know they're so damn late there she goes
no labels going to be out there putting out your music, any, any mainstream labels. It was all rock, metal, and uh, a new wave. We were uh, at one point approached by Lisa Finch or Frontier Records. She loved the band. I was a big Black Flag fan, and I only saw them a couple times with Keith. Then I heard he had a new band, and I had seen Greg Hudson in, in Red Cross. So it was already kind of a super group in a weird way. I was on the Cuckoo's Nest and they were just so insanely fast and energetic. And Keith's a great front man. He was just so on top of it. We went in to the group sex recording session having played all of those songs. I mean, in those days there was just no support and there was no funding for any of this. It was all kind of backroom stuff. Produced by a guy who was never there. The Invisible Man. Greg's father did the agreement. He was an immigration lawyer, so probably not the best agreement for all of us in the world, but uh, it was a three-way agreement between Kerry Markoff. I think he put the money up front, and you know more on savory stories, but I was not there. Our deal was done on a uh, large paper bag filled with uh, marijuana. That was how we got the studio time. They used uh tape that was used, it was pre-recorded. Usually I think you want to use tape that hasn't been recorded on before, but group sex is recorded, it's like re-recorded, and so you get some of that grainy sound on the tape. And on the original pressing, we were afraid nobody would want to buy it, so we added like four or five seconds to every song to make it seem like it was longer. And like, instead of 57 seconds for a red tape, it would make me go, go be like, ah, oh, it's a minute four. This, this herky-jerky hour here, two hours there, three hours there, went on for maybe a couple of weeks. I'm surprised that there's any continuity to that recording session. Private swing party Friday and Saturday. Wouldn't it be nice to have a party with the couples of Friday and Mellow? A low-key atmosphere where you can explore your most sensual fantasies with other aware sensitive couples. With the release of Group Sex and the documentary The Decline of Western Civilization, we flew out and did a handful of dates on the East Coast. Unfortunately, Lucky had broke his hand in a fight out in front of the Starwood a couple weeks before the tour, and we were like, are we going to cancel? Are we going to postpone? We all wanted to do it, so we got Charlie Quintana from The Plugs to play and fill in while Lucky was healing. And after about a couple of shows, Lucky was like, I'm not staying home and missing that. He came out, like watched the show, and then he said, fuck it, and took his cast off weeks before he was supposed to, and he goes, I want to play these shows. Yet I remember having a good time, and I remember that the shows, I thought they came off pretty good. When it was great, it was fantastic. Playing with the Cramps, and playing with Minor Thread in Washington, D.C., and playing with the Necros and the Stimulators at Irving Plaza in New York and playing for Cheetah Chrome at the Mud Club. We would collaborate a lot, you know. I'd come up with a verse and chorus, Roger would have a bridge. I'd have him, he'd have two parts, I'd go, what if we had this in there? And sometimes Keith would go, go, dun -dun 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 -dun, and then we'd try to figure out what he meant, and then he'd get songwriting credit as writing the music. I think I brought in the music for Paid Vacation. I might have brought in the lyrics for Murder the Disturbed. We were playing versions of songs that hadn't quite progressed, like we needed enough to play like a 20, 30 minute set at a party. I looked at the guys in the band and I said, all of you have played in other bands. 
Have you written any songs? Have you written any music while you were in any of these bands that we could use in this band? So we would play, you know, uh, maybe lyrics that Keith wrote to music of Red Cross. Right there created a very tense situation because there were a lot of disgruntled people in some other bands that were accusing us of stealing their songs. And then I just kind of ended up stealing some riffs and they did, but those guys at that time, so they didn't want to be in a band, so like, use it. In Black Flag, I'd written some of the lyrics and as a, as a lyricist or the guy who writes the words, you own half of the song. Any of the songs that we used by any of these other bands, we always figured out a way to change the shape of the song or change a tempo here and there. And then people get bummed and then you're accused of being rip-offs. And... But at that time, um, I, I, I felt a bit of desperation. The sophomore jinx is what they say, right? The Circle Jerks had signed a deal with a division of IRS records. Called Faulty Products, and it was us and the Dead Kennedys, and I can't remember, DOA was on it, I believe, and it was a step above. For better or worse, we uh, went for a, a more expensive studio. We can get you a deal at A&M Studios. Oh, great. Cool. Herb Alpert. Love Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. We weren't able to get the sound that we got from that super uh, uh, basic, raw sound that we got on the first album. We had to go in there and make it in like three days, like done and mixed. And I, you know, I remember playing these tracks thinking that they're gonna be rough guitar tracks and they ended up being the tracks. So I thought the guitar sound was thin, we rushed through it, and we weren't really quite happy the way it came out. It, it, it didn't hit the mark at exactly the same spot. Thank you. 
he went to a tour at, during the spring, and look, he was still in law school, so the band had to make a decision. Do we replace him? Do we wait? We went to the tour more. We knew he couldn't. We knew that day was going to come someday where he'd probably have to leave the band. I was actually, I had done the entire band while I was going to law school, which is, you know, depending on what kind of a law student you are, either something I recommend strongly or don't recommend. For me, it worked out real well. It was a great uh, humorous counterbalance. We approached Lucky, said, we're, we're going to England to record the next record. He said, I can't go with you. I'm going to school. We said, well, we've got to replace you. And I thought it was a little premature because we didn't really have anything set up. And the situation with England fell through. So I was pretty unhappy and there was friction. So um, I had some outside interests and so I was the first to go. We replaced Lucky with a guy named John Ingram. He was a friend of Roger's from when Roger lived in Kansas City. So now we've re replaced a really amazing drummer with just a guy who can play drums. One of his first shows was us headlining the Santa Monica Civic, or co-headlining with the Bad Brains, and, you know, having people chanting, where's Lucky? Where's Lucky? Where's Lucky? <laughs> locked into what I would call uh, my dark ages. Maybe it was also the dark ages for the band, but uh, I had become completely in love with cocaine and any white powders, any kind of white substances like that. And it was also what I would call the beer bonic plague. I was up to maybe a case and a half, two cases of beer a day. We'd be leaving the hotel right as the cops were coming in, that kind of thing, because uh, a certain band member would get drunk and end up having to be kicked out of his room. We'd have to kick him out, and he'd have to sleep in the lobby. Keith? Being a cocaine addict and an alcoholic, I was trying to keep up with the Seven Dwarves and trying to sit atop the Matterhorn at Disneyland. So th this area, a lot of the events that took place were just, uh, maybe I was in a blackout. <laughs>
John played on the Golden Shower of Hits record. We, we finished writing that. We recorded it. John started playing a bunch of shows around, and he just wasn't cutting it. He was lured out here by Roger. It's like, well, we have this position in this band. We're a really popular band. You can make a lot of money. Uh, chances are you'll buy a house on the top of the Hollywood Hills. You'll be limoed back and forth, and you'll be surrounded by exotic dancers and you know whatever other party favors you choose. And it didn't happen. We weren't getting a lot of money to record. Um, some of us were just barely able to pay our rent. We found out that Jack Biscuits had just quit Black Flag, and we're like, okay, well, we can't miss this opportunity. Roger moved from bass to guitar. Roger decides, I don't want to play bass anymore. I'm a guitar player. I want to play guitar. And we invited Earl Liberty from Saccharine Trust to play bass with us. I knew Keith. Keith came from the same city I did. I knew his family. They, they owned a tackle shop right down the street from where I lived. I knew Keith, but I wasn't real good friends with him. But we knew each other from being in the scene, you know? I mean, everybody kind of knew each other back then. So now all of a sudden, we have this really amazing rhythm section. Earl Liberty, Chuck Biscuits. Chuck and I had toured with Sack and Trust and Black Flag. We had a pretty good rapport, and I absolutely thought he was probably one of the most uh, hardcore, uh, most energetic drummers I had ever heard. <laughs> Roger, as amazing a musician he is, pulled off bass player being wasted or whatever, whatever he was on, could not play guitar drunk or high on any anything else. Somewhere in this period, Roger overdoses, and we have a tour coming up. So we go out, he joins us for some shows. He's really frail, he can barely walk. He wants some kind of rock star treatment. He wanted his own hotel room, and we're like, Roger, we only got X amount of dollars to last us from gig to gig to gig. We all have to sleep together. You know, we're gonna get two rooms, we're gonna split up, and we're just gonna deal with it that way. And he was absolutely no. Roger had become kind of a hindrance. We all woke up the next morning, we went to go get Roger, and he was gone. Just left. Called around all his friends in LA, they never heard from him. Like, poof, disappeared, and we were all happy. We were hoping he wasn't dead. Finally, it got to a point where we just couldn't wait anymore. We had to get on to the next gig. If we didn't get on the road, we were going to miss it, so we left. The shows were so much better without him. And we're like, we don't want him back. What do we do? We felt bad. We didn't kick him out. He was an original guy, really integral part, but his, you know, his partying was affecting the band. I mean, worse than anything that Keith was doing with, with his drinking or whatever. You're not pushing the sound up. You're not making us sound any fuller. We had this management company at the time that kind of distracted him and got him to start working in another direction and writing songs with Jimmy McNichol, who was a, a former pop teen idol. So uh, your, your services are no longer necessary. <laughs> That 
that one was a really uh, powerful lineup. With the force, the way Chuck plays drums, with sticks as big as tree trunks, and Earl being like 6'5", and, you know, he'd take out his false teeth when he played. And uh, he had these teeth, he had gotten him in trouble with the cops, they chased him. He was an innocent bystander and got his teeth broken out because of the police. Well, Rob Holtzman, who used to play with Suck and Trust, he used to call me Earl because I used to play basketball and he used to call me Earl the Pearl. So we were practicing down in um, San Pedro at the Star Theater one night and actually uh, the Minutemen and Black Flag both walked in at the same time and Dee Boone he looks up at me and he goes, God damn you're tall. He goes, you're like the Statue of Liberty. He goes, that should be your name, Earl Liberty. Golden Shower of Hits comes out, we probably did 18 tours on that. We kind of toured that sucker to death, but all the tours were successful. And we started even to play college towns. We're here taking a poll tonight, and we'd like to ask this gentleman, what do your parents think of this bullshit? They love it, man. Fucking, I wish my mom and dad were here so they could see this shit. That's beautiful, thank you. Now get lost. <laughs> of energy. I mean, how could it not be? Chuck Biscuit's one of the greatest drummers. That really kicked us back up into, like, world-class contention. My band, Minor Threat, it was the first chance time we ever got to open for a huge national act. Happened to be the Circle Jerks. It was the 930 Club. It was on my 16th birthday. On my 16th birthday, I saw the Circle Jerks, I got my driver's license, I lost my virginity, and I met Greg Hessel. No lie. All one day. It's all been kind of downhill since then. We were able to play with them uh, at uh, Cal State Northridge. It was a very large show, and we opened up for them, and that was very exciting, because I, by that time, uh, they had uh, been on Rodney on the Rock a number of times and had actually played Bad Religion demo tapes on Rodney on the Rock. So it's really, if it weren't for the Circle Jerks, Bad Religion would probably never have uh, been um, asked or recognized rather by uh, Rodney on the Rock. And so that was always very important. To the gentleman that ripped off the mic off the stand up here, could you please give it back? No questions asked. <laughs>
Yeah, there was a little bit of change, you know. Songs like, even when they shoot, it's the fan. It's more like a, a Who song. It was more in response to a should I stay or should I go. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I, I like that open chordy thing. I want to write a song kind of like that. The only recording that we have with Chuck Biscuits, and this is insanely ironic, is a track that we did for the Repo Man soundtrack where Greg Hudson, Earl Liberty, and Chuck Biscuits all played acoustic guitars accompanied by a drum machine. That was our, our acoustic version of When the Shit Hits the Fan. The studio sent us over there to do the, the track on that and we all played acoustic guitar on it and then did the actual track and then, and then shot the film afterwards. So we basically lip synced that. We had this management and they, they said we shouldn't do it, we weren't getting paid enough. And we said, we don't care, we're doing it anyway. And it was probably one of the best things that ever happened to the band. People were just like, who are you guys? You know, kind of thing. <laughs> you know, oh, you, they had, I remember they had the lunch truck out there and it was like, okay, you guys eat last kind of thing. And it was, you know, we didn't care. We could care less. It was like, fuck this shit, you know? I met the Circle Jerks on the set of, of Repo Man. And uh, I was very enthusiastic. I, was, I came up to them and I said, hi, I'm Kevin the Nerd. Oh, no, I'm Xander. I play Kevin the Nerd in, in Repo Man. And they just walked by me and didn't say a word. Grumpiest guys I had ever met. Was it the manager that got you on television? What yeah, they it? got us on this show called Rock Palace on NBC. Keith came out in, uh, I believe, a Michael Jackson uh, outfit. So he had the uniform with the glitter glove. And it was around that time when Michael Jackson had that, that album come out. So it was kind of a kind of mocking him a little, but it was, but it was fun. Tension was building. Tension was building between Chuck and the band due to his, uh, you know, his attitude. Chuck moved around a lot. I mean, he was with D.O. Wade, and he was with uh, Black Flag, and he was with the Circle Jerks, and then he was, I think he was with uh, Soldier Distortion, and then he, you know, he played with Danzig. We got offered to play this party at Club Lingerie by John Doe. We were about to go on, and he's like, I'm not doing the show. It's like, why? Because we should be getting paid for this. We're better than this. I think Chuck could take it or leave it. But you know what? He was good enough to, to say that. And I said to him, uh, if you don't do the party, you're out of the band. And then he just lunged for me and grabbed me by the neck and tried to strangle me. And I remember Greg just hauling off and kicking Chuck between the legs so hard that he lifted Chuck off of the ground. And of course, Chuck was never to be seen after that. 
I remember hitting that last note and just looking at the crowd and going, wow, this is it. This is the last time I'm going to do this. But, uh, and I remember standing outside, getting into my girlfriend's car, and just looking up at looking up at the Perkins Palace and just going, wow, I can't believe this is the last time I'm going to do this. You know, but, uh, you know, I had a great run. <laughs> eventually had Earl leave to become a, a born-again Christian. I asked my friend Michael Bowsery, better known in the music community as Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, to play with us. Things were changing and, uh, you know, everybody decided in protest to grow their hair long. <laughs> I had witnessed a band called uh, Megadeth. And this would be the Spinal Tap version of Megadeth. Keith Clark was playing drums. And he wore a big wig and wore chains and leather pants. And Keith Clark joins. We still have Flea. That makes for a really interesting vibe. So the fundamental rule of punk rock bass playing is something we call the downstroke derby, where all downstrokes like that. Flea enters, someone who never plays with a pick, and I've never seen anybody in my life that can downstroke with his fingers, and it's pretty amazing. Granted, his style of playing wasn't as aggro as a guy doing a downstroke, a guy playing bass with a pick, because Flea was doing his plucking, but it was cool.
comes up for flea to do the red hot chili peppers and it's obviously time for us to find a new bass player. Yeah. Yeah. He's a snake. No, that's the snake, so all he can see is... Try it. Here's a snake car. Snake! I got the, the, uh, the gig, I think out of like 50 bass players or something like that. Keith Clark just said, the last guy that just auditioned is the guy that I want in the band. Keith would like go around and say, we got this this new guy in the band, and uh, he's like, he's a really good musician, but he's like super nerdy. And Xander is not really a bass player. Xander is a guitar player. Xander is uh, GIT, Guitar Institute of Technology. But my original instrument is, is guitar. You know, I've been playing guitar since I was 12 years old. GIT was basically just a noodle factory. You know, let, let's churn out some Eddie Van Halens. And they asked me at the end of the audition, they said, why do you want to be in the Circle Jerks? And I said, well, I've been playing in this band down in Compton and Watts, the Juicy Bananas, for a couple of years, and I just, I just don't think that black music is ever going to make any money. And uh, I want to be in the Circle Jerks. I want to play punk rock for the money. write the wonderful album which was you know a little a little bit of a departure in sound but not too much yeah I joined and we made that record wonderful and six and uh, of course uh, our, our swan song oddities abnormalities and other curiosities six which was our fifth album but we called it six just because we thought we would be clever and we thought we would throw everybody for a loop and people would go to the record store and they'd pick up six and they'd go, well, where's the fifth album? Keith Clark would, would bring a guitar on the road and I would bring a guitar on the road and, you know, we were roommates. So it naturally kind of occurred that, that we would kind of be up jamming. Greg would chip in here and there. I'd, I'd toss in a line here or there, or write a set of lyrics, and the, the Circle Jerks had almost become Keith Clark and Xander's band. I wouldn't say that, that, that 
um, it was solely me and Keith Clark that, that wrote songs. I can remember sitting in uh, uh, Dog Shit Park with, with uh, Keith Morris and, and writing songs across from his apartment there on like uh, Selma and, and Franklin. For everybody everywhere, this is called The Crowd. came about, I think, as something that was a safer alternative to going to a punk rock show. I never had experienced people jumping up on stage, you know, moshing and doing stage dives, and sometimes they would bump into you, and sometimes there'd be like 10 or 15 people on the stage at one time, like dancing around, and, you know, I would be afraid they'd knock my glasses off or something like that. We went kind of more towards the rock end, just more straight ahead rock, but without the virtuosity, because I ain't no virtuoso. <laughs> Overnight punk rock scene to this glam metal scene, like polar opposites, where people wanted to not be rock stars. Everybody wanted to be a rock star. I wish I would have bought stock in the Aquanet back then. I went down to uh, to Nicaragua to do uh, Alex's film Walker during the Civil War down there. I came back from Nicaragua to go on tour, a national tour with the Circle Jerks. And I got a, a call from Joe Strummer saying, hey man, he was like, I want you to come to Russian Hill up in San Francisco and bring your Spanish guitars. I quit the Circle Jerks 
and joined up full time with, with, with Joe Strummer. Keith Clark managed to bring in a couple of other bass players. A guy named Ted Pittman, who we called Piddles. So we got Doug Carrion from Dag Nasty and uh, Descendants to fill in on a tour. We had Chris Poland, who was one of the guitar players in Megadeth, the capital Dave Mustaine Megadeth. So now there's this, this weird tie-in. <laughs> joined with the Circle Jerks um, and found myself at 125 pounds, strung out, locked in my apartment, seeing uh, ghosts and uh, kind of losing my mind. And at that point, I, uh, I made a decision to, to stop. I have been sober, what they call sober. I've not touched any of that stuff for probably 23 years, 24 years. I stopped counting. I just, I don't do it anymore. It was almost like punk rock really was wiped off the face of, of Hollywood and the world. Uh, it was just forgotten, swept under the rug as a minor footnote in rock and roll history. And then all of a sudden, one band comes out and totally kills heavy metal, like Black Flag kills Ants on Contact. That would be Nirvana. Explode. 
back even in the early days, we'd be like passing out flyers and he used to be drunk and just screaming, ah, I want to destroy you. Like, you know, throwing shit at people in, in the streets of Hollywood and the South Bay, Orange County. And it's like, but what is that? And he goes, oh, it's a song. So, you know, 20 years later, we get around to recording it. Circle Jerks signed with Mercury Records and that was pretty much a disastrous situation for us. Sweet and sunshiny singer Debbie Gibson hadn't been dating the guy who produced the new album by the long-running California punk band The Circle Jerks. The two parties surely would never have met. As it happened, though, they not only met, but Gibson wound up doing backing vocals on one track of the album, a cover of an old soft boys tune called I Wanna Destroy You. I wanna destroy The reason we went for it was because we're fans of music, we listen to a lot of these bands, we've been purchasing records and singles and cassettes and reel to reel and eight tracks and singles and whatever all these years from all these different labels and we just figured, hey, why not us? the 90s and uh, money in the, in, the, in the major industry was was flowing. I mean, it was like a gold rush back then. There, there's all these millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars being tossed around to all of these bands. And we uh, get a call from uh, Roger Rogerson. Basically, he was driving a truck in Idaho and had this epiphany that he wanted to come back to LA and be a rock star. This was the year that, um, I believe that uh, it might have been the year that punk broke. He had, uh, I remember, long pork chop sideburns, and in some ways it was the old Roger, and in some ways uh, it was kind of like a Frankenstein. All of a sudden there's this band called Green Day, and Green Day has this album called Dookie, that sells a zillion records. He was actually uh, super intense, uh, kind of manic, calling everyone on the phone, we've got to get back together. It's our time, it's our time, we get, ah, and say, like, okay, right, right. Well, maybe he's right. I mean, he sounded delusional, but, you know, maybe, maybe he was right. The original Circle Church were gonna get back together. We were gonna write some songs, we were gonna record some songs, we were gonna pass out our demo, we were gonna get millions and millions of dollars, and we were gonna be as big as Nirvana. I said, let's all get together just for fun and do another jam session like the old days. And it was all set and everybody showed up and it was like, well, where's Roger? An hour goes by and two hours go by and it's like, well, this is really weird. This was the guy that was calling. This was the guy that wanted to do this. It's like, oh, typical Roger doesn't show up. And we get a call the next day from somebody, like a roommate is saying that he, you know, took a lethal dose of two different types of drugs and was dead. Apparently he just mixed himself up a really juicy combo platter of see you later. That was it for Roger, done like uh, two and all Valium, Coke. And it was just like, he called to say, hey, checking in to say, hey, now, now I'm going, see you later. I guess none of that drug stuff ever, you know, and suicide or overdose just never really makes sense. So that was it. The architect of murder gets top billing. Yet another victim, another slain. Casualty.
Jet crash, beach cash, toss up disasters. How many were lost? Casual vampires see nothing but rain. trying to write this record for Mercury and I'd be in and out so the band would get frustrated I'm like well, well we'll just we'll have Dick Stenny from the Weirdos sit in and help out and just play the part of Greg it was just not the whole unity of the of us all together in one place all focused with just on circle jerks and the album kind of sounds like that the circle jerks made an album that probably shouldn't have been made for a major label. I was in Bad Religion and we were having our major la label success, the, the three minutes of that. And, uh, and there was some tension between the Circle Jerks and myself because it was really hard to juggle the two bands. Bad Religion was, was always sort of a, uh, a thorn in, uh, in Keith's side because of their schedule, their touring schedule. I showed up at Soundcheck in Detroit and said, this is my last show, it's not fun anymore, I'm going home. Not only that, but, but you know, Keith Clark's tax schedule, we couldn't tour in spring. I had to ma make a choice of, of struggle with the band that already struggled for 10 years to get to a certain point and then break apart and start all over. Xander had run off and he'd started a band with a guy from Steel Eye Span and uh, I guess a Pogue or a couple of Pogues and a couple of actors. They got signed to a major label. And I felt guilty. I felt I had let some of my best friends of all times, people I've known for all my young teenhood and adult life, down. You know, when, you, when you're around people for as long as we've been around each other, um, all sorts of resentments start to pop up and it's just not healthy. It's just tough, like, you know, getting into a, a room with, with that amount of history and the amount of, um, you know, baggage and, and damage. Every night it would be so great. I never ever have to masturbate. My parents would be so glad they wouldn't give their boys a bag. This guy wanted the Circle Jerks to come over and do like a full-blown European too. After long years of, you know, everybody going their different ways, uh, Keith had moved out of state for a while. And he, uh, you know, calls up and is like, maybe we should get the band back together, man. I contacted Greg and said, look, let's put the band back together. Let's put all of our differences aside and let's do this again and let's do it for real. Well, the latter years were, I think, based on a renewed interest um, by, by Keith. He had a, um, a sort of um, renewed lust for life after getting diabetes and, and getting sick. I was in the process of leaving, leaving this earth and you know, going to another planet, you know, 
jumping on a flying saucer or whatever, going someplace else. It's no wonder that, that he would start to appreciate the things in his life a little bit more and, and, and want to do things. And remember, this is a party. No fighting, no fucking around. Everything will be cool. Make friends. Jump around, get loose. Fuck, smoke, drink, but no fighting. Let's leave that to our government and all the people they send elsewhere. Keith wanted to clear the decks and uh, bring in a new drummer. I was a little apprehensive because, you know, Keith brought in a drummer that I never heard of. Keith Clark was out, um, and Kevin Fitzgerald was in. Uh, reluctantly, me and Sandra were like, okay, we'll give it a shot. He more modeled himself after, like, the lucky years, you know, real super, like, ramshackle and, and aggressive, angry drumming. So Kevin comes in, he knows the whole set, he he just like kicks ass, he brings this new fire and intensity, and, and I was convinced that, you know, yeah, we got a shot. We basically got back together and we were, I would say, more of a revival band, going around, doing, um, mostly songs from the first three records. We've been fortunate enough to be able to get away with doing that year after year after year because we built a really great fan base. You know, cashing in on our, our legacy, cashing in on our, our name and our logo and stuff and trying to ride that out. You know, we were capable of pulling into a town and pulling anywhere between 500 to 2,000 people. <laughs> Circle Jerks for years and years and years was like, that was all I really knew. Granted, we weren't one of these overly creative bands. I didn't particularly enjoy the fact that we weren't producing new material. It took a lot of prodding and a lot of people pushing us and telling us what to do to get to the point where we would record a record and we were close to recording our first record in like 14 years. With this guy, Dimitri, sort of um, as an intermediary. I think Keith is one of the best, if not the best, punk rock singer, 
front man ever, but I think he's a little insecure. And when every time it came to writing and recording, he would freak. Thinking to myself, well, what are we? Faith Hill? Has it gotten to the point where we need outside writers to come in and, and write a Circle Jerks record for us? We were actually being creative. We had somebody that was cracking the whip. We had somebody that said, okay, here's your schedule. Uh, we, we have to have this done because one of the other guys is going off for three months with one of the other bands that he plays in. Maybe there was still that animosity. Maybe they, somewhere everybody knew deep down inside of their head that it couldn't be full time because I still was in bad religion. And that instead of going in and, and um, writing lyrics to the music that the Circle Jerks had come up with, Dimitri and Keith wrote an off record. It was really frustrating, especially for me. Keith, I think everybody was frustrated, all for different reasons. Dimitri was fired as our handler and producer, and Keith was very, very upset. And when they fired him, they fired any of my wanting to make a Circle Jerks record. It went right out the window. I know Keith always somewhere, he always wanted to do something of his own. I think that was eating at him for years. I have a new band with Stephen McDonald. This is very ironic, but it's also very full circle. See, we've gone back to the church. We've gone back to the basement in the church. He's happy doing what he's doing. Um, he's supportive of me doing what I'm doing and that I should continue to, to do what I'm doing um, and not wait for the Circle Jerks to do anything. No shows, no new record. Uh, basically, everybody's moving on. I feel very fortunate to have been a part of, of kind of history in a way, you know. Um, I was there in the very beginning with a couple of big bands, you know, Black Flag, Second, the Second Trust, um, you know, the Circle Jerks and then all the other bands in, the, in that time period and, you know, that, that was a movement that probably will never happen again. We did whatever we had so we had to, you know, fight to get gigs in spite of having like a groundswell of support and people that wanted to see the shows. There were no venues. Uh, most of the clubs uh, boycotted this kind of stuff. So it had to uh, find its own way. You might remember a character in sports, Bo Jackson. He thought he could play baseball and football. Bo knows. What happened to Bo? He couldn't do it. Couldn't handle it. Got injured, ruined his career. He couldn't play either one. That happened to me. I will say that I, I've closed the door, but I've not locked the door. I'm not going to walk away from something that I helped start. The legends are not based on being active all the time. Legends are based on their absence. So what a legend does is they do something great and then they disappear mysteriously for a while and then come back or die but <laughs> legends are based on their absence so it's no wonder that the circle charts have legendary status
film rated? <laughs> you can say whatever you want. Actually, my first question to you was, yeah. was um, have a seat, make yourself comfortable. Yeah. How long have you been a drummer? Are you recording? Yeah. Look at me, and just not in here, look at me, okay. and uh, we'll just sort of go. And then uh, basically, tell me how uh, you came to the Circle Sure. In the summer of 1980, I was roadieing for the Teen Idols. We went from Washington, D.C. all the way out to California. They had shows in Los Angeles and San Francisco. We went up to San Francisco, and we were camping out at Target Video. And someone points over and says, you know, that's Keith Morris. And we, me and the Teen Idols guys were standing there, like Keith Morris, like the Black Flag guy. Introduce yourself. Well, my name is Mark Vidal, uh, aliasly known as uh, Earl Liberty. I mean, L.A. was the same. Um, it just was. And, you know, when we came out, people came out, and it was, it was great. It was, you know, we got a really good, uh, we had a really good rapport with, with the people who came out and saw us. Like, to, to tell the true story. Yeah. Without, yeah, without, you know, you know, really no heroes. I mean, everyone is, everyone is both, you know. We're yeah. All, everyone, people everyone's are human. Everyone's the villain, everyone's the, the hero. As to, you know. Yeah. Get the dog up. And we're rowing. Take two of the Keith Morris interview. For my so you still tour. have stuff left over from the first time we tried New England. I, I so. had, yeah, I hadn't, I haven't looked at it. I don't even know if there's anything usable in there. But uh, well, we're we're not too far from the sheriff's station, so we're right across the street from the Starwood. Hopefully, we'll we'll have some emergency situations where we will be interrupted by loud, noisy sirens. It's in sense around every day. <laughs> Beverly Hills, century city, everything so nice and pretty. And all the people look the same, but don't they know their fucking life? There she goes. Baby Sue, Brenda Grant, Cowboy Boots. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't have to move from Beverly Hills, century city. Everything so nice and pretty And all the people look the same But don't they know They're fucking late There she goes Pippi Snoot Magic Pants Cowboy Boots I don't know what to do I don't know what to do If I had a gun I told them exactly what to do Beverly Hills Century City 